Well, I'm from the DOE, and I am actually on you. So if I don't know something, then I will find an answer for you. But just know that there could be some that you just don't quite know yet. Um, but I started out teaching kindergarten, and then I eventually um, changed districts, and then that put me in the upper grade setting. So um, I've been as low as kindergarten and then as high as fourth grade. So that's a little bit about where I came from. So we're going to start off by looking at the main um, shifts of, of math and where they're going. So when Indiana transitioned to Common Core, and then when we left Common Core, the driving focus of all of those, we're looking at um, these different components. This is what we'll look at today. Uh, the first one being focus, which is really your basic um, standards that we have, those very content-driven specific things that you have to learn. So just so you can see a few um, of what's out there. So hopefully you all have seen the standards page, but we have the mathematics page. And I will give you a copy of the PowerPoint at the end. You have access to it, so you don't have to write down so it's building But if you go there, one of the nice things is that you have your basic standards, but if you keep going, at the bottom there is a resource guide. So if you click on there, you get your general resources, but then each standard is broken down and it will tell you um, a sample problem, um, what it really is going for, and then there's going to be some, uh, usually at least one link or more of uh, a website you can go to to see more specifically or get a specific example of what that standard looks like putting it in action. Um, so that's there. If you find a broken link, just to me an email because I'm in the process now of going through fixing all the broken links. So, um, but you have this guide available to you. Um, if there are keywords that this standard alludes to, then they've kind of been pulled out there. That doesn't mean that they are specific vocabulary they have to know in kindergarten. It's just some um, keywords that when you look at the K-12 scope, that these are important words they need to be exposed to in hearing. So. Those are the resource documents that are there for you. And then, even though we are not a Common Core state, um, if you go online, you can pull Common Core resources and then use the correlation guide to see how that standard matches up to what we're doing in Indiana already. So those are all available to you. One of the things that we're going to talk about today is looking at the process standards. So there is, for elementary, there is this site that you can go to, and it's going to look at different um, pieces of math, um, of the process standards coming into play, and it's going to give you a short video, and it's going to be of a classroom teacher actually teaching the lesson. Um, what happened is the DOE partnered with a university, um, University of Southern Indiana, to create these videos so they are you're able to watch the short snippets of the video it's not the entire lesson and then there's some reflection pieces so those are available to you if you're wanting to see how some of them come into play um, the nice thing about math with the process standards they are k-12 so just because it's not a kindergarten or first grade video the process standard still is in play no matter what grade level you're in so they're not specific to each grade level um, it's the same strain you just go with what's developmentally appropriate of the process standard at your age. So um, those are some videos that are all available to you. Um, if you're not familiar um, with our Office of eLearning, they have some different components on social media that they use. They also have some Google online community of practices. So if you're a Google person, um, those are options to you. It's one of those that it's just another connection piece, so it's not the, the save all end all, if you will, it's just another connection piece that the DOE has out there available to teachers. Um, it is monitored by our e-learning people, and then uh, if questions pop up, then they'll send them on to one of us, and um, we try to monitor them. Um, the downside is that I have about eight to monitor, just being the scope of all the grades, so, um, so we'll get an answer there, too. Uh, the other thing is if you do the, um, if you um, join John Wolf's um, Learning Connection site, 
um, I created a, a second one that would be for elementary, that would be our math and science and the STEM component, um, putting it all together. That way elementary teachers only have to really focus on two learning connections groups, the literacy side and then the math side, and they're not being pulled into all different kinds of um, groups and information. So. All right, so that leads us now. Um, so the focus, really, all of those sites bring you to the focus of math, the important content, all of that that has to be taught. And then when the shift happened to try to move us to rigor, the coherence piece brings in your math process standards. However, um, focus is kind of circle because the process standards do incorporate um, part of focus also. They, they help be that bridge between everything. Um, but the coherence piece is really looking at um, the logical progression, making sure that students have the skills necessary to be mathematically um, proficient as they move through each grade level. So um, it's just really that bridge to get them to think at a higher level. So Indiana currently, um, we have eight process standards, um, and they all are, they're not, the big thing is that they're not specific, they're very broad, they're very, um, like a huge net that gets cast out there to bring them in. Um, and then we're going to look at a little bit of how they're grouped. So um, it does play an important role of how they're grouped there because it determines the way that the thinking towards them. Um, the big thing on the process standards is that they are, Um, they are what the students need to be successful in math, but also science. So this spring, um, you're going to be seeing the new science standards coming out. And what the new science standards are, we're, we're in the process of um, putting them through the final review process. So if any of you want to look at them and give feedback, um, I can send them to you. Because when we built them, um, currently we have the nature of science, and we have the design process of the two science standards there. But we're really looking at um, the process of how that happens. So the math process standards also correlate to some degree with the science process standards because it's all about that process that you would use in science. So we are applying it into the math side. So it's really that what the kids are doing, how the kids are interacting with it. Um, it needs to be embedded in the daily instruction, and it is already. So what you're doing, um, you're already doing some of them. It's not something that you would do all of them every single day. Two of them you would see every day. The rest of them would depend on the lesson and the content that you're doing from there. Um, and it's really trying to get them to think like a mathematician, to behave like one, to really get them in that mindset so that way they are um, successful as they move in their upper grades and, and on out into the, um, the field. All right, so what I want to do is to take about um, five to seven minutes, and then I want you to go through the process standards. Um, they are, they're very meaty, they're very, they're very big. So the content are very short, very concise, but the process standards, uh, you, you really get the whole shebang, if you will. Um, that first sentence usually gives you the brief summary, but then it kind of broadens it. So uh, I want you to read through them, and I want you to circle, make note of any words that illustrate um, the actions. This doesn't mean verbs, though. So um, when you're looking at them, any word that you think would really give you that picture or what the kid's actually doing, um, or if you have a word that it's like, that, that's an interesting word to use. Um, and then we're going to break them down of how that looks here in a minute. So. Does anybody need a tool or something? I have water if anybody needs it.
that when you read them, they're K-12 because they're applied in every grade level in like you form, but just keep in mind that uh, it's developmentally appropriate for what age you have. So um, not that I step, um, who knows what will become, but the way it is now, the I-STEP tested grades cannot be successful without the foundation and the hard work that you guys put in there. So the process standards, you will see them and how they're assessed on I-STEP, and it's really about um, are they able to work through the processes and, uh, and show different ways of thinking and the behaviors they go into. That's really where they're looking at and they get those scores on I-STEP. So setting the behaviors early and getting them thinking about the good behaviors um, just helps build on that then each year. So the first thing um, is, is kind of what jumps out at you. We're really small. So um, what jumps out at you when you read them? Whether it be good or bad or scary or, but what jumps out at you? Okay. Is there a particular word? Every other. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> I noticed that all of them had something where the student was self-monitoring. You know, mm -hmm. each standard had where they were checking themselves. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Anything else? All right. If you were to uh, take a snapshot of your classroom, um, what would you see happening in your classroom that you're already doing that would pull from the process standards? Self-checking. Okay, self-checking. Explaining. I know like a lot of times we ask, well, how'd you get that answer? Or why do you think mm -hmm. that? So. Okay. Anything else? Like as far as quantities actually showing that, you know, using manipulatives in a mm -hmm. multiple, you know, different ways. Yes. So I'm not just using 10 blocks in one block, showing me in a different way what that represents. Exactly. Perfect. Now, the big thing is, how do all of them start? Because that they're mathematically proficient. Exactly. So. Everyone starts with mathematically proficient students. The reason being is that these are just those basic processes that students need to start thinking about to be able to move forward with problem solving and those higher order ways of um, engaging with math. So when you look at them, they're actually broken down to where one and six go together, um, and they're kind of those overarching strands. So it's looking at making sense of the problem and really persevering to get through the math problem, and then attending to precision. So you're going to see in every math lesson that you would teach, you want them to really make sure that they are getting things right, trying to get where they need to go in the correct way, but also just that they're getting through it. They're not um, stopping. And then the two and three are your reasoning, explaining them out that way. Um, four and five deal with um, the different types of modeling and tools that come into play. And then seven and eight go with structures within math problems and making those generalizations. So we're going to look at the first two um, problem or process standards and, um, and how they overarch through them all. So what I'm passing out is kind of a look for is document. And what that is, is it was created as a way to help teachers, administrators, everybody that's a part of it to, if in the evaluation piece of it, if you're having those informal 10 minute walkthroughs, what is it that would be in a quick picture in your classroom? What is it that somebody could look for in an evaluation to see what's happening within the classroom? So that's where that came from. One part of it is that it shows what the teacher would be doing, so the look for for that, but also what the students are doing. So the first two, um, the first process standard looks at uh, making sense of the problems and just really persevere in solving them. So what is it? How does that look in your classroom of what the students were doing? Mm 
And these are just quick snapshots, um, and you have more in your paper. But what is it then, if somebody were to walk through the classroom, what is it that they would see? The student student. If they're reading a problem and underlining important words, circling yes. vocabulary words, I mean, I've seen that in your classrooms. And that, that's exactly it. So we say make a um, plan a solution, but specifically, what does that plan look like in your classroom? What are you doing to help them in their minds to get a plan? That doesn't mean that we're writing out on a board um, every way of doing a solution, but just how have you taught a kindergartner to solve a kindergartner or a first grade problem? How, how are they playing that solution? So it may not look like it does in the upper grades, but just trying to get them to think, okay, you see a problem, how are you going to plan to solve it? It's really where that's going to us. What are the teachers doing? Giving them strategies. Okay, giving them strategies. A big part of this one too is really this is kind of that strain with the teachers, the cheerleader for the kids, getting them to keep going, to not to give up, to keep trying, really to get that persevere through. So this process standard really is kind of that positive reinforcement um, is how, um, how I always have looked at it. Um, but it's also that you're providing them opportunities to be able to look at a problem and think at it in a little bit of a higher way. So not every single problem would be one that they're going to have to persevere through because you're always going to have those problems that are simple and all of that, but just trying to provide opportunities that they're able to think about a problem um, that takes a little bit more time to think about it. The second one is attend to precision. So how is that in, in a primary classroom? How is it that you're getting those students to, to really make sure that they're getting correct answers and right answers? I always make my kids count twice. Okay. I have it like a self check. You get the same number, then chances are you're probably right. So, or they count with a fear. I do a lot of collaborative. So. Perfect. So there's your self monitor piece that's coming into play. Absolutely. Anybody else have any other ideas that you use? All right. Um, and a part of it looks at um, attended precision. The little plug is vocabulary there too. Having the students being exposed to vocab words in math that they should know. So a piece of it is on the document that I showed you um, under the focus piece with the content of math vocabulary, that precision of, of vocabulary is critical there. Um, I know that the primary classrooms, you have a different purpose for a word wall with your sight words and all of that. But one idea is to incorporate some kind of a math word wall that they're able to see some of those words. You're not putting up every single word by any means, but just some of those that you think are really important that when they leave kindergarten, that have a little bit of a math focus that um, they're able to see. Because the big piece is that as they move into the upper grades, there's never been a point where when do they have to know what a certain word means. So when I'm in fourth grade, if I were to say to them, what is the product of three and five, so I feel like they should know product means to multiply, but they don't have that vocab word of product. So where does that word come into play? So then where does the word sum come into play? So if they're adding different quantities together, are you saying the word sum or are you just calling it adding? So adding in those different pieces of trying to get the stair step happening so we're not throwing all these words to them at one time, but just getting that precision even of vocabulary is really critical right now. And some of that is looking at what it is that your, um, if your school has looked at any kind of curriculum mapping, any of that, just what are some important words at each grade level so you can build down then from there. And that doesn't mean we're writing them in sentences and all that, just the exposure of correct vocabulary. So the next two are really looking at reasoning out what it is they're doing, why it is they're doing and being able to explain it, that communication piece in there. So the first one, this, or this is usually the one that gets people the most, um, and that's um, process standard two, looking at abstractly um, and quantitatively reasoning. What is it 
that that would mean and look like of what a student is doing at a primary age. Because that's a really long one, has a lot of big words in there. So what would that mean at more of a younger age to you? It could be. Yeah. So if you have a word problem, having them find the different pieces of their, of the quantities that comes in play, absolutely. So at a primary age, what are the two quantities that's coming into play here? It's going to be my two and my three. So just having them, even at the most basic of levels, to be able to look at that and know that two is its own standalone component of it, three is its own standalone component. When I add, then I put these two quantities together to get my answer. So that's really where that's looking for, it's just that relationship of numbers, um, being able to identify the different quantities of a problem um, of its most basic component to it right there. So for a student component, if I was looking around the room, does the student realize that a two and a three means that I have two of something and three of something and I'm putting them together to get a new total? Um, what is it that the teacher is doing then if we were to do a look for of the teacher's behavior for this process standard? Okay, how would you guide? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, it's correct. So, yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. No, no, you're absolutely correct. I just want to see now, how is it that you guide? Just by showing them in different ways the grouping, mm -hmm. you know, by using manipulatives or... Absolutely. So, that's the big piece. You're bringing that manipulative, so you're crossing out to another process standard to be able to show them that. Um, another component, does anybody need anything else? So another component is training them to be able to have a conversation with a partner, to be able to point them out or being able to mention it. Uh, maybe you're not really looking for that full five minute conversation, that's not, but it's just being able, if they're working together, can they point out and kind of be able to talk about, verbalize to somebody that they see different parts of here. They may not say you know, this part, this part. They're, when they're talking about it, are they able to realize, okay, this is a component, this is a component that I'm putting together, when they look at that kind of a problem. At kindergarten level, what would that look like? What would that conversation look like? Um, it's going to be, by the end of the year, the goal would be if you are, um, you know, if you're working with teddy bears, say, mm -hmm. and you're giving them problems then, are they able to say, if you were to say, um, we're adding red, green, and blue teddy bears. You have three different colors out there, and you're putting them out. Are they able to rationalize that, okay, all of the red teddy bears make up a quantity. Okay. All of the blue make up a quantity, all of the green. Um, and then that means that if they're working in pairs then, um, are they able to say, you know, oh, we've got to put all the blue together to their partner. So then they're able to verbalize that they're seeing, they're telling their partner that that's a quantity there. Okay. versus just saying, putting them all together and calling it um, five. So. Um, the next piece of it is the third process standard, which is really that um, communication piece, which also piggybacks on what you just said, and the sense of that conversation then is that critique piece also. So if I'm a student that I take one teddy bear and I take three teddy bears and put them together and I'm with a partner, Am I able to say to them, wait, I, two means that we need to have two of that color, not one, uh, you know, which is that most basic level of critique, but it's able to being able to tell somebody that they're wrong and, and explain why you know, you're missing a teddy bear in a positive way. Um, and that's where that piece is coming into at that level. Then as they get older, the goal is each year that they build to, the, to your higher grades, they're able to be able to talk to somebody and explain why something's wrong in a positive manner 
and they're also able to construct their response by giving true reasoning and they're using correct vocabulary to explain it. So you're starting off with your basic addition here, um, you know, if you're lucky, then getting the, by the, you know, through the year you're getting in kindergarten them to say, but the sum cannot be four, we have to get, you know, so just being able to construct those arguments is really what we're looking at at this level here. Um, this doesn't mean that you're writing everything down. Some people look at that as constructing a response um, is not writing it. It can be you know, with a partner, it could be with the teacher, another adult in the room. Um, it could be on paper, it could be using pictures or whatever, but just being able to give a, a reason for why something is. Maybe you're showing them this kind of a problem and you ask them, you know, explain to me why this is the way it is. You know, or if you have a parent volunteer pulling out different kinds of math problems to construct and having them explain it. Um, putting the, um, the teddy, you know, well, when I talk, you use the teddy bear to do your position words, um, put the above, below, all of those. Um, why is it below? Oh, well, because the block is, you know, at the top of it, and, you know, so just those most basic communication pieces, getting them to critically think about why it is the way it is, not just below, on top, all those pieces. And then the big piece for the teacher here is that you're just providing those opportunities for that to happen. It's not going to be every single problem. It's not every single time you do something. It's just really you're providing specific opportunities to get them to that level. So this process, these two are what I think elementary teachers are gifted at. They are the best known for. These are the rock star process standards that we're using. And I think the primary teachers specifically are the very best at this. As they get to the upper grades, then it gets, they're good, but not like our kindergarten and first grade teachers are. Um, the first one just being that model with mathematics that um, here I have that problem, I'm modeling the behavior, I am really showing what it is um, visually. And then the next one is just using different tools there um, that we have available for math manipulatives and all of that. So thinking about your classrooms, when is it time, and, and you can reference either one of them when you do it, but when is the time that you've let them model their math? I'll say the other day I we had a story problem, and few was one of the words in it. So I just had them go to different sides of the room to determine which side was fewer just to get them to see what the word actually means, so they would know how to do the problem. Perfect. Yeah, so that's the perfect example of modeling that visual component. Has anybody else said anything? Are you first or kindergarten? First. first, okay. So in kindergarten, how is it that you model your mathematics? I don't know who all teaches what. So. I do like, um, we do Odd Todd and Even Steven, and so then we come up to the front of the room, and then whatever our number is, and they have to find a partner, and so then we say whoever's left out is Odd Todd, so that's how you explain you have to have partners to make even numbers and numbers. Perfect. Yeah, that is exactly it. That is that modeling component for them. How is it that the teacher, what, what's the role that the teacher's doing in this? He's just helping them to see it. Absolutely. Not telling them, but giving them the example so they can come up with the solution. Absolutely. So the big point there is that self-exploration piece like um, you were talking about, and then the other component there too is that if they're getting it wrong, then that you are sh you know, leading them on the modeling part of it, and that you're exposing them to multiple types of models. So as you're going through your lessons, thinking about, okay, when I look at all 180 days of instruction, have they seen other types of ways to model some form of the math concepts um, as we move through the year? What are some tools that you use? Teddy bears, probably would be my guess. But what are other tools that you have available that the students would be engaging with? Ten frames. Ten frames? Yeah. Yep. Ten rounds. Lots of rounds. All of those are exactly what students need. Even your, your high ability kids, all the way down to your struggling students, um, those that 
maybe looking at RTI or if they're already identified at this stage. Um, they all need the entire spectrum needs the tools, not just struggling or just your your average piece of it. Um, what is the teacher doing to really enforce and show this process standard? Providing tools. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when I taught, I had this kind of a control thing that I didn't like them to play um, with all the tools all the time, just because then it lost the, the focus of it and, and the whole germ thing and all of that uh, when they would do stuff on them. But the thing about it is, is that when we're doing math with them, so we have a leveled library in our room generally, I think most do, have some sort of a library book that they can go and get a book and all of that. But in your room, do we have any opportunities for them to be able to go get a math manipulative, a tool to use on a math problem? Or is it, do we, is it only when we provide it for them for the specific lesson? Mm -hmm. So it's trying, huh, I'm sorry. Only when we provide it. Yeah, so kind of this tool, <laughs> this strategy is showing it that if they need something and they realize it, letting them use that tool. If they, um, and the other component becomes, okay, here are different types of things that I have available to you. Can, what tool can you use to solve the problem if, um, correctly? You know, giving them that, it's that self-choice, that self-monitoring, but it's letting them know that they know that that tool will help them solve that problem correctly. So, however you want to approach it, but one thing to think about is being able to provide some kind of a little math library that they have an option available to them. Um, another option would be for this process standard is that if you know if you don't want anything lost, stolen, damaged, all of that, um, you know, is that if you put pictures on the board of different tools that they have available to them, you know, and they can look at the pictures, you know, oh, can I get this tool here or, or whatever, um, and really, um, you know, this is balancing self exploration and the enjoyment side um, with this, but having them think about those, those uh, manipulative, not necessarily as toys, but they are math tools. So even though um, you have teddy bears at home that are toys and fun, but thinking about those teddy bears in class not being as a teddy bear toy, but that's a math tool that we can use to solve problems. So trying to shift their thinking, not towards just fun and toys, but fun and tools. So, are there any questions on this? I'm glad you brought that up, though, because uh, some of the I-step questions, as we move forward, they, they're, they're, we're, they're not going to tell them they need this particular tool. The student has to make that decision, and so if we're doing it in the younger grades, mm -hmm. that would help them be thinking of that, what do I need for this? So that would be a great you know, thing to start. Absolutely. In and grades. my goal um, would be for as students in the kindergarten and first grade, that they're hearing tools, 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 then as they get to those upper grades, they're able to say to their teacher, can I have this tool to help me on this problem? Or the expectation is that they're going to be exposed to a tool that's appropriate for that grade level, not, um, not that they're just ignoring it. Um, and a big piece too is at the upper grades, they're given rulers. And then they'll be provided rulers when they get to the eye step to one another. But a teddy bear, in a lot of ways, those very basic manipulatives should be thought of as, as a ruler tool. That important because when they bring in the rulers from home, um, you know, and they're spinning them like helicopters, it's that they need to think about that as a tool, not a toy. So, um, you know, kind of shifting their focus when that teacher says, that's a math tool. Oh yeah, because I didn't get to really think about the teddy bears in kindergarten as a tool in first grade. I thought of it, you know, or as a toy, it was a tool then, this is a tool just like they were. So they're able to start bridging those connections together. Um, the last two are looking at the structure and generalizations. Um, so process seven is that looking for and making use of structure. And I think that's a very big one for kindergarten and first grade. So what does that look like in your classroom? Whether it be what the students doing, or what the excuse me, or what the teachers doing. The 
the patterns in the hundreds chart? Exactly. Yeah, so those patterns in the hundred chart is, is the perfect one for seeing that. Because if you, if you don't start there, then how can I do um, a Fibonacci sequence where I do one, two, three, five, seven, and on up? If I can't see the pattern that's forming here, So this um, is a Fibonacci, so it's where you add the first two numbers, you get 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, and on up. So that, that pattern that you would look at in the upper elementary, you can't do that if your kindergarten and first grade teachers never showed you blue, green, blue, green, blue, green. So the importance of what you're doing makes them be successful in this. But if we skip out by thinking, oh, we're just looking at shapes, we're just looking at colors, um, you know, and when we breeze through that, and they don't see the importance of a pattern, they're not going to be able to see the importance of a pattern up here. So this process standard looks at the most basic level, and then how does that build? Because the concept's the same. Your quantities here would be colors. Mathematically, in that terms, would be the colors you're looking at, you're dealing with. Up here, the quantities would change to the sum and adding your different numbers. So that's a big piece there. Is there any other ways that you guys use patterns um, or show the structure relationships? Addition, and you say, you know, plus one, you're always going up one, or mm -hmm. you count up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because, and another component would be, so if I'm doing a pattern in this stance, my structure, if I'm going to add two and three, so at a, at a, a kindergarten, first grade level, the structure of setting up an equation. Do they realize that to set up and structure an equation correctly, it has to go 2 plus 3 equals 5? You're not, you may, but the expectations that the kids are leaving, they're going, I can do addition equations in class, and I'm writing equations. But you're introducing the, the structure of an equation, so then when they're developmentally ready and it's in the curriculum of the focus of those content standards, the other teachers then can pick up, you've set the structure, now we're going to start calling the structure an equation from there. So, um, The last one is looking for um, an expressing regularity and repeated reasoning, which is the same thing as, if I'm adding numbers here, okay, what's the reasoning behind it? It's plus one this time, it's plus one. So finding out that reason, what's the rhyming reason for what's happening? So if I have a repeated pattern up here, then What's that repeated reasoning that's happening there behind it? So really setting that, I think that here is where primary is going to focus their most time on, just being able to see the structure and patterns that are there. And then as they grow, you're going to be able to start being able to see that repeated reasoning and really being able to, um, to break it down what they're looking for. This also is where they're starting to realize, oh, there are shortcuts here. <laughs> In third grade, they're multiplying. Well, that's early skip counting that we know. Where should they learn to skip count? In third grade, should we expose a third grader to skip counting, or where does that happen? So that repeated reasoning here is that, okay, if I have this pattern here, I'm going to add one each time. Then as I get to third grade, the bridge has already been built because of the work that you guys have set as foundation in this process standard. Are there any questions about the process standards at all? The big piece is that when they are assessed, they're not assessed on a process standard only. The process standard is always um, tagged on to some other kind of content standard. 
So they're, they are given a focus question that's specific to a content standard, but the process standard comes into play of what they do to show how they solved it. Um, so when they are doing the um, <coughs> part one, it may say to use words, pictures, symbols, or however it's worded. Well, that's helping them show just that process of an engine, just for the person to see, you know, what they did. So, in a brief way. So the next step is rigor, which builds us down, um, and we're going to start off by looking at how it's made up of, and you're looking at the procedural, the application modeling, and the conceptual understanding. The procedural is where Indiana used to focus on, and now we've shifted to the other leg of the pedestal of conceptual understanding. The important piece is that um, there's people that are saying that um, we are no longer doing any kind of rote skill, we're no longer doing any kind of basic questioning, we're not doing anything low level, um, everything's always harder, higher, and that's not true. Even the I step is, has these most basic questions. I mean, at an elementary level, it's really hard to assess conceptual understanding. Um, so the big thing is getting the kids to think <coughs> towards conceptual understanding, but the procedures, they have to be there. I can't be successful in multiplication if I don't understand the procedures of how multiplication happen, happens. Yes, there's a conceptual understanding component there, but we can't forget the procedure part. So even though you're hearing everything's getting harder, 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 it's really not. It's really looking towards their understanding and thinking at, at a higher level from there. Um, so the big difference is, so these are just different quotes that I've pulled, but the procedural part are just this action sequence of solving a problem. I do this, then this, then this, then this. That's the very basic procedural part. The conceptual part is coming into making the connections. Okay, if I have uh, 3 times 5, how am I being able to build a relationship of uh, those different um, factors? Sorry, I lost the, the multiplication numbers for those different factors. If I'm doing addition, Am I able to see that the add-ins are coming into play? And do I have a sense of what's happening to understand what's taking place? Or am I just adding because it's just what I do each time? So the conceptual understanding is going to look very different at each grade level because you're going to think of it as what's developmentally appropriate for that age group. A five-year-old has a different conceptual um, knowledge base than what a 10-year-old would have. So. When you're trying to build, when we think of rigor now, the big thing is understanding that conceptual understanding, and it's really the how to get to the answer. What is it that they have to do, instead of just being able to, um, just to say exactly what it is, do they have that number sense behind what it is they're doing? Um, can they see the math and understand it, you know, that visually, that modeling, or are they just doing it because they've memorized it and moved on? So that's the big um, component there. If I'm adding, then, and I have 2 plus 3, if I have memorized 2 plus 3 plus 5, then I have procedural understanding. If I want to take it to conceptual more, then I'm going to look at it as, whoops, I can't write on the board when I do that. All right, so the conceptual part would be, do I see the modeling that's behind the problem to get there? So at, at this most basic level, that's the, I'm going to use teddy bears. Then as they get more comfortable with teddy bears, then I'm going to have them transition maybe into drawing dots, circling out the dots. Or can I give them, or if I give them the five dots, and I tell them, okay, I want to do, I have five, and I want, I know that I have three of something, what do I have left? Okay, then can they conceptually, if I have three, then here's a quantity from the third process standard. That means that I have to have two left over. So there's my reasoning behind it too. So this is that more conceptual base because I can't just do a basic rote memory and having to build from it.
Um, one other piece too is this comes into play with math facts. So as they move, um, as they get older and they're being focused on that, if they're able to visualize these, then instead of having that rote memory of your multiplication facts is generally what we shoot for, um, do they have, are they able to look at the pictures <coughs> of multiplication and see that and then bridge that connection to what they learned at the basic level? Being able to see this will help a student with that conceptual understanding to be able to pick up their math facts faster to get that rote memory piece of what they need for the multiplication facts. So there is that connection there to the importance of what they need. Um, just some examples, that would be the students are providing evidence. So if I'm doing things and you're asking them, critiquing one of those pieces, then okay, like prove your point. There's that, are they able to provide that evidence? Having them give their own specific um, examples. Giving them the tools or telling them, okay, go pick out any math tool you want to use, and then I want you to create some problems um, that deal with these certain quantities or you know, here are some numbers that I've picked for you. So even though we're referencing it as numbers, they're going to be able to start conceptualizing, seeing them as that's a quantity, that's a quantity there that they're dealing with. So how many of you have heard of the schema that we use in reading? So it's there. It's the same thing for building schema in math. Um, there, there's no difference between the two. You're doing the same thing. I think probably four years ago, schema and reading really, I think, blew up, and that's what you have to do. Now it's starting to think about it's the same connection um, that we have in math. And it's that building that, that background knowledge, pulling all that information that they've already learned to be able to do what we do in reading. So when you're teaching, going through and the schema strategies you use in reading, try to build that connection to using them in math. Um, so if you're using strategies and posters of the different um, reading strategies, background knowledge, making connections, all of those, then start tying it into math. You know, if we're going to start something on day 170, can we have the kids start building that schema to what they did previously in the year? Um, can they make connections to real life and use that as something that they've experienced or done or make something up? So really having them build on what schema they already have going on for them. So the two procedural areas fall into here. And then our higher level um, conceptual understanding goes into here. education have kind of shifted a little bit and we say that they've changed and we've got this new thing going for us but in reality we really don't so we started off with Bloom's taxonomy everything was Bloom's taxonomy all the levels of Bloom's taxonomy you have to know them get them to the highest levels of Bloom's taxonomy and then now all you're hearing is depth of knowledge um, DOK ask those kind of questions and everything so this is set up into the DOK levels so the level one is just that basic memorization. I'm just repeating it. Three times two is um, six. So just that most basic component of it. Then if you go to the next level, you're starting to do the procedures of I have an algorithm. I have some kind of an equation that I'm having to, to plug things into. Um, and I'm not explaining my work at all. That's going to be that level two. To take it to the next level is the connection piece. So level two has no connections. It just is because it is, because this works every time. But to take it to that third level, that's where you're building in your connection piece. The fourth part is just I'm doing the mathematics because I don't, I just know um, why it is the way it is, because I can model it and I can think about it in multiple strategies. It's connected to 
some of the subject or content or idea or something like that. I'm able to see all of that. Um, and I have to be able to really explain and communicate my reason out for why I am doing these mathematics pieces. Um, what I know that you're not um, I step tested, thank goodness. But one thing I want to point out is even when you hear about the I step <coughs> tests, um, people are starting to say that we're moving down to here for the shift. But in reality, there will never be any of these level of questions on the I step, any of the level four. Um, it's just not possible to assess them that way. So it's one of those that you'll see these three levels, but this part would never happen because this is hard. So what I'm saying that is that don't think that you're doing this kind of math all the time, every single day, because it's not even, it's really something that you're working towards. You've got to set the foundation and you'll get there by the end of the year uh, and providing the different opportunities. But if you went in to your classroom and all of a sudden you're going to be down here and start doing mathematics and all of this, they, they would, you would never get them ready for first grade or second grade. So that's not the expectation. It's that whole, you know, I'm, I'm using some of each area. The goal is that they're being exposed and they're interacting with and they're doing the higher level demands, but that doesn't mean you cannot, that doesn't mean you're not doing any of these because you have to. It's just having that nice blend. We're going to use that paper some more too here in a minute. Um, one thing that to move the teaching to a higher level, um, there's some five basic things to think about. The first one comes into your planning stage. So when you're planning out your next lesson or your week's lessons, it's that anticipating what it is the students are going to be doing. What is it that you want them to do? What is it that you're doing? This doesn't mean that you're writing out pages of what you're anticipating. But it's just trying to ingrain that as you're planning, you are thinking, oh, how would Nick handle this? Or how would this group that I have, um, you know your students best, you know your students, so only you can anticipate what they would. Um, once you've started the lesson, it becomes that monitoring piece. So this is a lesson that you are working at that higher level, so you're not doing that rote memory piece. So it's that monitoring what they're doing, so you have out tools, or they're working, they're engaged, then your job then is to monitor what's going on, but with the monitoring the piece is that you want to think about what their actual responses are, whether it be right or wrong. If they're wrong, let them be wrong and move on. But just thinking about um, what are the actual responses that the students are saying. Um, and however you want to do that, whether they're working in any way, shape, or form, but just what is it that they're coming up with. The third step just comes out selecting it. So at your level, you're not going to expect them to write out sentences and about critiquing and why it's wrong or why it's right and all of that. So your job to help start modeling those behaviors would be to select some of the responses that you want to present to the entire class during some kind of whole group or small group instruction to point out. So the purpose of the monitoring is that way you're, you're doing meaningful selecting and you're not just getting those um, teacher pleasers. You want to get the sprinkling of kids who've thought about it in different ways. So when you're selecting kids, you're not really looking at, okay, we always did it this way. They made dots, they circled it. Did anybody do anything differently? Or if I did dots and got it wrong, the goal, too, is that if you select a kid that has very low self-esteem and still got it wrong, that they're able to build confidence to be able to at least talk about and reason out their answer to be able to get it correct. So trying to build that, that cheerleader spirit of being able to take even kids that are not getting things correct to build from it. Uh, then it becomes the sequencing. How is it that you want to call on them? Do you want to start with wrong answers first? Do you want to start with um, your right answers? Do you want to start with kids who did it for more of that procedural rote memorization? Or do you want to go with somebody who did more of that conceptual understanding of seeing um, the problem coming into play in a more visual manner and all of that? You know, it's that, what is the, the attack 
um, how do you want to tackle it, really? And then that bottom piece, that connecting, because we know that level one and two, there's no connection being made. To go to that third level of um, procedure, I'm sorry, that third level of, of a demand test has the connection piece. And then to be able to just to be doing mathematics, you're connecting it left and right and everything. So this is your way to come into play of being able to show the kids, model for them, and help them make the connections that they need to make. And then that provides opportunity for them to make connections to other people's answers that they did that you did not even call on. So this is kind of the way to start building out on those higher level demand tasks. So there's five, um, there are five um, questions that you should ask yourself when you are building your curriculum and you're checking your curriculum to see am I really going towards a rigorous space? Am I getting that strong foundation being set into place for the students? The first one is what are the process standards that I'm going to use? That's important because it's not that you're, you're writing out process standards every time. It's that, okay, I've got these five lessons planned. Okay, how are the process coming into play? Am I using tools? And there's some kind of patterns, reasoning, just that you're thinking about, okay, there is a connection to the process standards. Again, not all eight will show up in every lesson. It may just be um, just the two. But just that we are having that thought of, oh, the process standards are there. And I'm saying the foundation of the process standards. Um, the next two is, what are, what's the teacher going to do? What will I do? What will my students be doing? Um, what do I have to do to facilitate being the important word there? Not necessarily teaching them and doing all the talking. How am I going to get them to teach themselves and be able to see that conceptual piece of it? And then what is it that I want them to be doing? So when I give out the activity, what is it that they're going to be doing? Um, and then just pointing out, okay, am I at a procedural level or conceptual? So once I've figured out what they're going to be doing, then I can know, oh, I'm at procedural. The thought process there is that we know that great teaching has both of them. You're doing both. You're not doing all conceptual teaching. So if when I think about it, if for the past two weeks I've been focusing on procedural teaching, then how can I build a lesson or get the next lesson to start tying in maybe a conceptual piece of it? Just try to get that blend going on there. The last one is just what I'm being rele uh, relevant, meaningful, and connected. That big connection piece. Um, look towards your sciences, uh, your science instruction and content to be able to pull in some of the connected pieces there to try to do some of the blending. Um, when we've built some of the new sta science standards, it's trying to make them a little more open for teachers to have more freedom to do what it is they want to do and connect them, but still have that, okay, here's kind of that foundation now that you need to know. It's kind of where they went, because we know that the process standards in math and this, that conceptual understanding of math and having things be connected, that it's going to need to be connected to science too. So it's kind of that same the foundation, so that's just kind of that background knowledge piece for you. Okay, so I have four questions for you. A 30 minute period, uh, this researcher went into a classroom and he researched, or he um, examined, I think almost 100 teachers um, in a school uh, or in a district. And so he brought the teachers together and he asked them, how many questions do you think you ask in a 30 minute period? So thinking about your classroom, and I had the question one time, does that mean that I'm asking a kid if they have to use the restroom? Or if I'm at, you know, don't think about necessarily those <laughs> classroom management pieces, thinking about the math content piece that goes with it. So when you're teaching a math lesson, about how many questions do you think within 30 minutes you would ask, or that you think you actually ask? Okay. So I have 20. Can I ask something different? I 
Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, well, what would you guess then, Neil? Like what I actually do? Yeah, what would you say if I were to come in your room for math? Probably should be like 50, it's probably what you're wanting. But. <laughs> well, this group of teachers, they brought them together, they predicted that they ask about 15 questions. It's actually what that group of teachers predicted. All right, the next one is how many questions would be desirable? So how many of the questions that you're asking, how many would be a desirable number of what you think would be good to, to be asking? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Like deep the calorie calorie stuff, then it's like, well, that doesn't really matter. But if I say why or a good yeah. question, we really only need a few. Yeah. That's what we were thinking. Okay. Well. So you you might want less because you want you want them to be questioning. Okay. So you're on the right track of thinking. So you're absolutely the conversation <laughs> is perfect. So this group of teachers again said that well. I'm asking 15, and I think 15 is a good number, is kind of how the, the conversation was going. Um, the next one was, how many questions do your students ask? And again, thinking about it as um, the math side. Now, I have to use the, can I go to the bathroom? You know, it's, it's one of those, um, if you're teaching a, con or a concept in math, what, what do you think would be a good number? <laughs> So this group said that, um, oh, our kids asked about 10 questions, is what I get from them. Um, that's kind of where they were at. And then that, you know, how many would be ideal? So if you took your students and you were planning out the perfect lesson, what is it, how many questions would you want them to ask? During each other or each? each Just student. they're asking questions. So. You know, it could be asking to a student or to somebody they're working with, or it could be to you, or just that they're posing questions. So class. each student, how many questions you want each student to ask? Um, just how many you would get. Oh, you, know, you don't mean like, hey, how do you do this? Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want those questions. Yeah, no. Okay. I'm not saying to one. <clears throat> So they like the number 15 because they went to 15 again, this, this group of teachers. So when the researcher was done, he tallied everything up, he visited the classrooms, and he found that those teachers on average asked 50.6 questions. So they were, they were up here, and then when he did the student side, he counted the student side, um, it was 1.8 questions. Yeah. Um, and, and it was one of those, the article goes on though, but it talks about how the teachers basically did not agree with him, they felt that he fudged the numbers, um, and so I think he did some videotaping too. They watched some of the footage and they were like, oh. The point of the research though was not to, to chastise anybody or come on there. Uh, the whole point was is that we know asking questions has to happen. But we have to, and we, we know that asking deep questions and really good questions is there, but just because we know that it's great practice and good things, it doesn't mean that we actually do it, because it's hard. It takes some, some skill on our part to be able to get there. So the whole point of it is just that um, we know it's good, but it doesn't mean we always do it, um, even if we know it is. So as I move through the questioning slides, Keeping in mind that it's not going to be all of a sudden you're going to go back and you're asking all of these perfect high order questions. It's just one of those that strategically you're taking time to really think about the lessons and some ways to get really good questions in there. Starting off, you know, bite off a little bit, but just trying to strategically get some questions that spark that discussion piece. So just a, a purposeful question um, is really you're wanting to go for that current understandings. Do they understand, or where are they at with their understanding of whatever it is you're talking about? Um, you're really wanting them to, to elaborate, so when you're asking a question, you pose a question, and then they're going to explain, elaborate, uh, clarify, <coughs> all on their own, is where the goal is headed. So that way you're not going, well, what do you think? Well, tell me more, why is that? 
that you're trying to get them to go to answer questions and have that conversation piece um, because they know that that's what a good mathematician does. And then the last part is that making it more visible um, and, and you're making it accessible in the sense of poverty or race or whatever it is, that they're able to make those connections that they need to make, that there's no barrier standing in their way uh, because they're able to have that discussion piece with it. So the primary side, it's not that you are having them hand write out answers to questions in your grades papers. It's just that building purposeful questions to get the discussion going. And I think that, that we have great questionings. It's just trying to get some of them to go a little bit deeper. I taught kindergarten. I know it's difficult. It's, it's, <laughs> you know. So, but it's just trying to get them to get there. So there's a quote here that I want you to read and, and think about what it says for a minute. So what does that quote say to you? That I need to know how every single one of my students are thinking. Okay. In order to help them. Do you have any different thoughts? Not to just assume, like don't assume that they're just going to catch on or that everyone knows the concept. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that ties in to the process standards component of, if I'm going to ask these questions, then do they know, understand the process of mathematics? Or are they able to, to see you know, the patterns or the tools or whatever it needs to be successful in answering their questions? To be able to, as they get older, we're going to be able to continue to deepen it. You know, a, a kindergartner's knowledge you know, is probably this deep. So your, you know, your goal is to, okay, can I deepen it a little bit? first grade a little bit more. So as they keep building, it's going to keep getting deeper, um, and they're going to be able to understand about the elaborating and the communicating and um, explain their reasoning just that I don't get it. So your paper has it, and we, when we looked at the um, demand task, we kind of talked on it briefly, but there are four levels of questioning. Uh, depending on what researcher you use depends on what they call it. Um, Webb has her version, um, Hess has a version, but uh, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, they gave out these four titles of how they are saying mathematics, um, the levels of questions come in. They just kind of took all the different current researchers out there and they gathered those four titles of how they build. So the first one is just that gathering information. So when you're asking all the questions, it's just that basic recall, you know, what does that word mean? Well, what's, you know, if I'm going to add, what do I have to do? It's that most basic way of getting information. This has to be there. You have to gather information, even at, you know, at the most basic levels. As they get older, you know, it's going to build higher, but, so as I say to the others, don't think that I'm saying we don't do this, because you have to every day. The next part is that probing the thinking. So if I'm asking a question, then I want to start seeing, are they, are they kind of understanding what it is that I'm saying or, or the concept that's coming into play? Um, they're really starting to, to make a connection in the sense of they're elaborating. They may not have that full connection there to another concept or um, problem, but they're starting to get the thinking built there. Um, they know that there are steps to a solution, and it's multi-stepped, but they're, they're starting to work towards there. Here's the most basic one simple step, generally. Here is becoming more of a multi-step. Um, one thing to note is that 
don't take necessarily the demand task, the four levels of the demand task, and put them perfectly to here, because you would find some differences. But this is just taking the, the depth of knowledge research on questioning that's out there. But you're going to start seeing that building up of, if I, as I start probing my thinking, it's going to start being the um, math with no connection with the demand task. But here, you know, I'm doing a plug and chug multi-step solution. You just plug the numbers in. Then there's really no connection to anything. Um, but some of the words you may see overlap, but that's the, the thought behind it. The next part gets you to the three. This is where the keyword here is visible. Um, they're taking those words, and the kids are able to show the full structures. They're making connections to different ideas and relationships that are out there. Um, they're, they're really, they are not, so the next one is their opinion, basically. So encouraging reflection and justification. Um, this is, is their opinion of what's happening. This level four depth of knowledge, the true level four, will not be on the I step. So when I talked about the doing mathematics of the demand task, and I said that that demand task is the full doing. And yes, they are doing mathematics, so don't I don't want to mince words there. But when you look at the true level of depth of knowledge and providing an answer, this is where they're providing an argument, a justification. It's their opinion. Um, there's no way the state can grade an opinion. There's just no way to do it because it's an opinion. So you're going to see the other three, but this one, even at, at all grade level, is going to be difficult to get to, and it's going to look very differently. So I know, I know that we're primary, um, but if I had this question of one half plus three fourths, um, what would my answer be to that? And if you have like a little piece of paper, jot down your answer. All right, so what do you have for an answer? Five fourths or one half. So which one did you put? Well, if you had to pick one, which one do you pick? Uh, well, I went five fourths and then I changed it. Okay. Did you make anything different than saying five fourths or one and one fourth? All right, so if I want to increase depth of knowledge, so I have this most basic um, problem here, but a way to increase the depth of knowledge would be to, okay, you've got this. Now give me the correct solution in three different ways, but you can't use any of the digits that you said first. So if you said five fours, then you can't use five and you can't use a four. If you wanted to go with one and one fourth that you said first, then you can't use a one or a four, the digits. So what would be three other solutions to this problem? And the reason I did this is because it's kind of one of those that I know you wouldn't do fraction of that level, but it's a way to think about um, do you how like things build. A cup and a quarter of cup. Well, well, you write it down. Oh, oh so yeah, sorry. write down three ways. Uh, oh, I don't have three. I'm, 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 I'm probably not understanding.
take about one more minute. So to do this problem, to have a precision, a precision, with the, the six process standard, what would be the word that I have to know the correct definition to of what it truly means? Digits? Yeah, it's going to be right there. A digit and a number are two different things. So. The question then becomes, where do they learn what a digit is? You know, it's one of those that um, the state, you know, we don't tell you where that is. It's one of those, you have local control. So, so having that common vocabulary as a school helps build on that. So, you know, digit would be a word that they're going to have to be exposed to at some point. That's going to have to be a word that they know. So the precision of vocabulary, so think about that vocabulary piece coming into play. All right, so here are different ways to do it. So if I gave, if I gave one and one fourth, so some of them would be wrong depending on how I did it, but if I gave one and one fourth, then I could use a picture. If I did five and five fourths, the picture is fine too. Um, I could put it in word form here. Um, and I could do um, five fourths in word form also. That's a way to, to answer it. Um, I could put it on a number line. A number line here is going to be a very conceptual understanding of it. So going into, um, I could do a reciprocal fraction. So I did 5 fourths, then I could do 70, 56. Would that work? I did the 20 Huh? I did 10 eighths, 20 sixteenths, and 40, 32. <laughs> so, so which one did you pick first? Which one did you decide to go with? What was one of them? What did you say? Oh, I just, I guess I took it literally, like, you know, like, don't use those numbers, you use other numbers. Okay, so. And I said 10 eighths, 20 sixteenths, and 40 32. You said 20 what? You said 20 what? 30 seconds, but uh, 20 sixteenths. And what else? 40 over 32. I don't know. I, I guess I took it. Literally, like. Well, and that's fine. Yeah. So the question becomes: If you kept it as one and one fourth, this one wouldn't work because of the digit one. Okay. Yeah. But if you start with five fourths, <coughs> there's no five. There's no four there. There's no five or four there. Um, this one wouldn't work for five fourths because of the digit four. So the key there is that a ten to precision of the vocabulary is important. That they know what a digit is. So as you build. Um, with addition and using, you know, sum is what we call that. Those basic there, it's building there, so that would be out. So. Huh, that's right. And so, so if I did one and one fourth, <coughs> 70, 56 would work for here. If I started here, I could go here. But five fourths, this would not work because of the five being there. Um, for the number line, if I start with five fourths, this number line would be wrong. Why would this number line be wrong if I start with five fourths? Yeah, because I label it using the number five. So the digit five is in there. But if I start with one and one fourth, this number line would be a correct answer. Very conceptual. And I labeled them so you understand how they're divided out, but I didn't use any of the digits one and four. So this is kind of there to where as you are working on your problems in class or your basic adding or basic subtracting, thinking about other ways to give an answer, um, using the visual picture piece, um, whatever is appropriate for your classroom. It may be, you know, we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be writing out the full words. It would take you forever, um, depending on where you are in your curriculum. But maybe it's one of those you're holding up the number word. Um, if I have the number one, what's another way to do one? Um, which we're doing. So it's just to see things in other ways. 
Um, one thing to point out is that um, Bloom's taxonomy is not DOK. That researcher did a whole different way of doing it, different levels. Um, it's not the same difficulty. So a Bloom's taxonomy component doesn't necessarily have the same difficulty when you put it into a DOK. And, and we're not about the verbs. So I may use a verb that is uh, one level of DOK, but that same verb could be in two other levels. <clears throat> I could describe something, and I could describe it at multiple levels, uh, because the important thing here is, is what the outcome is going to be. What is it that, that they're doing, uh, not how to say how hard it is. I can ask a really hard question, but it would still be level one. What's the capital of Texas? The level one question, but it would be really difficult for a kindergartner to come up with. <clears throat> uh, the other point is you're looking at the mental processing that's going into play. What is it that they're having to think through? Um, that brain power that's going on to be able to answer that question or do what they have to do. There. We need a uh, custodian to the girls' restroom in the old building. Thank you. So what I've done is um, I have a Dropbox folder link that I'll give you that I've put uh, a variety of resources in, including this PowerPoint. So one of them is uh, the Death of Knowledge Wheel. Um, this is from Karen Hess. And what she's done is, is she's put all of the different um, DOK into this little wheel. But the thing about it is, is if you go off Bloom's taxonomy, some of these, these words here are going to make you think um, specific of the verb. So when I'm writing Bloom's taxonomy, usually if I use that one verb, then I automatically hit that specific um, level. Whereas for some of these words, um, they're kind of a guide, but just because you use these words does not mean that you wrote a DOK question at that specific level. So it's one of those that's a, it's nice to, to look at and visualize, but Ultimately, it's not about which word you use from which part of the wheel. It's about the behavior that's coming out of it. So here where they have taken, that's kind of hard to see. So a remember part of Bloom's is going to match up with the level one for the DOK, but as I move down, the create side for your highest level of Bloom's would be brainstorm, but it's only a level one in uh, a DOK question. So Bloom's, you've hit the high side of it. But in regards to a depth of knowledge, you're only at level one. Because the brainstorming of ideas, there's not much mental um, process in this having to go into it. They're just, oh, this is an idea, this is an idea, this is an idea. So it would classify as a level one. So um, if I say judge, um, <clears throat> if, you know, if I'm looking at the op a student's opinion and they're judging between two different things, the word judge, I think, in some of the documents, it will show up as a level three, but in reality, it is a level four because the behavior in it is that they're taking it to their opinion. They're arguing their point across. So I just wanted to point that because the word doesn't necessarily, just because you see the word, doesn't make it a depth of knowledge of four. It's the, the practice and the product of what's going in. And this is really kind of where, why the, <laughs> The wheel of education is shifting again to not necessarily be focused on the taxonomy part of it to what the actual outcome and the thought process is behind the kids. That doing piece, that um, connection piece. So.
And then we're going to do an activity. I did not give you this page, but you have access to it if you're trying to come up with sample questions. But these are just different stems that can get you started on thinking about what makes up a higher order DOK question. Um, we're going to do an activity, and I kind of pulled a middle of the road one. Um, I, I, I will apologize that I meant to pull a kindergarten example, um, but I got pulled for assessment reviews. So, but we're going to look at a third grade, but um, one of the questions I'd gotten one time was uh, from a kindergarten teacher, and she said, I teach kindergarten, and we're never going to do a level four DOK question. And my response was, you will. You will do those at those primary grade levels. It's just going to look differently than the higher grade. And she says, they're five years old. They're, they're not ready for it yet. We don't even know how to tie our shoes. And, and my, I, I, I get what she's saying in that sense. But again, it's not on the wording of the question. It's the process of the question. What is it that they're putting out? Um, when you look at kindergarten and first grade standards, some of the standards are developed at a higher level already. So your standards aren't necessarily a, a level one to start with. If I'm taking one of yours is to classify, I think you're classifying objects is how it's read or created, but if I'm classifying, classifying is already a level two because I'm actually having to take and whatever objects or manipulate I have, I'm putting them into groups, I'm classifying them out. So don't think that your standards are all at level one and that you'll never get to a level four. It's the process and the thought that kids are having to, to think into it. So that will get them to the level four. Um, these stems, generic. Um, so the first one's write a thesis. You're not gonna write a thesis. But that doesn't mean that the thought behind how critically a student is thinking about something or looking into something, it's still gonna be there. All right, so I kind of went middle of the road, and you have some geometry standards yourself. So <coughs> this geometry standard is coming out of third grade. It is an actual Indiana standard, and it's identified and described the following. Cube, sphere, prism, pyramid, cone, and cylinder. That's all the standard says. So as a classroom teacher, I have no idea what it is that specifically they have to know about those objects when they leave my, my classroom at the end of the year. Um, all it says is identify and describe. Well, how much detail goes into describing? You know, I, there's nothing out there that says what describe means, what identify specifically means at the level. But if I take some depth of knowledge questioning and I start off with there, what could be a level one question that I could ask my kids about? this standard. Name them. Huh? Name them. Okay. You can name them. So I could show the, and that's right, I just gave up one example. Um, so that's right, I could put the shapes up and say name the shapes. It's just a quick recall of facts. So I went ahead and created my question is how many sides does each shape have? They all have some kind of sides. Um, the vocab word there for attendant precision is sides. They have to know what a side is to be able to do this. So what could I, if I want to take this same question, but I don't want a level one question with them. I want to go to a level two. I don't want to change what the question is having them do. I just want to make it a level two question. What is it that I could ask? Okay. Yep, you took mine. Exactly. How would you classify these shapes? So now they're taking all the shapes and they're having to figure out how are they going to classify them, how are they going to put them in some kind of a group. Now, the beauty of that question is that it gives the students free choice to make the decision of how they want to do this, which gives the teacher the opportunity to be able to see it and if they're able to self-monitor. You know, as you're monitoring them, okay, take a look at that. You know, so you're able, it opens enough space in the question to allow them to have some decision-making skills. Oh, whoops. Did it too fast. I'll put it up. Okay. 
if I was going to a level three question, I could ask, explain the properties of each shape. So how does my level, what's the difference here between my level two and the level three here? They're explaining. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's giving them the freedom to, to say what the properties are. Here we're going to classify. Well, how would you classify a shape? You'd have to do the properties of the shape. So here, you're identifying that there's properties, but now they're going to be able to use their words, pictures, or however they want to do that, to be able to explain the different properties. So just grouping, now they're explaining it in their own words or however they want to do that. How can I take this to a level four now? Could you say something like which would be best to build with? Does that elicit their opinion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they're going to do that, they're going to be identifying which they think is best to build with, but they're also pulling in the properties. So you're not changing the question at all. You're just having them think about higher level. You're doing building, which fills into the usefulness. So how, are the, um, how do these properties make each shape useful? If I'm going to build with them, you know, it's that same concept, but it's an argument piece to where there's more than one right answer. So this is why this one's hard just to get to, and you're not going to see it on your standardized testing of any kind, because it's an argument. It's, the, it's their opinion. But this is that shift towards here. I think that we, we ask DOK4 questions um, and, and more of a conversation piece when we're having just a regular conversation very easily because we're having them talk about, you know, well, what kind of pet do you have? Well, why is that the best pet? You know, we're doing some of those persuasion pieces that are getting them towards here, that argument piece. Just kind of that, that break being built there. So I went with a, a basic subtraction problem. Um, you could change the numbers to, um, to a simple 5 minus 2. That doesn't change um, this kind of questioning. But what's the answer to that one? Right now, that's simply just a DOK1 question. All they have to do is just subtract it out and get their answer. When they do it, they would circle C, and I have that there. So, I understand that you're not going to give tons and tons and tons of multiple choice tests, but you do see them crop up. So how is it that I can take this one question and not make it a level one to make it two or higher? Could you give an answer and then ask them to explain what's right, if it's right or wrong? Okay. That's kind of where I, I hit it at. Um, but, you know, if I take which one's wrong and tell me why. If I do that, I'm going to have to know that the place value is off, or you add instead of subtract. If on a kindergarten <coughs> site, if I were to say 5 minus 2, well, then, okay, which one, and maybe you don't want them to write out words, draw a picture to match it. Which one's wrong and tell me why in a picture. That's going to push them towards that conceptual understanding. So then you're able to gauge, do they have a conceptual understanding of it? But it also takes it from just a basic 5 minus 2 equals 3. I'm almost done, so. Um, the last part is that is the mathematics discourse. Has anybody heard the word discourse be used in this part? Um, it's kind of... It, it, Yes. Yes. Okay. But, so the discourse is really just the, it's that discussion, that combination piece that's coming in there. Um, it goes into the process standard. It goes into the depth of knowledge of questioning. If I'm asking low-level questions repeatedly, so if I'm asking 50 low-level questions, then I'm never going to get a strong discourse in my classroom. To be able to get this, I have to start with low-level questions to train them to get to the higher level, but to be able to get there, I've got to be able to, to teach them how to do it. 
It's going to build on their thinking. The comment that all of you made wasn't the process standards, it's that thinking piece. How are they thinking? What are they doing? To be able to have a strong conversation, you've got to have the thinking piece. Um, and bringing in the process standards <coughs> can help build that conversation piece. So how do I start that in my classroom? When they're asking the questions, then ask them to, you know, you know the process standards, they're not going to know them, but having them reference them in the sense of, I used my tools and it showed however it did. Bringing in that way and then if a student says something, teaching them how to build on another student's question or comment or what they said. When we looked at the five steps for a math problem and selecting the one and going over a wrong answer, the discourse parts comes into there because you're able to see the kids thinking but teaching the others to honor that opinion and not be not be hurtful, mean, and that at the primary level will build on the conversation that they can have as they get older into more complex mathematics. So it is important to start uh, even in kindergarten. Uh, this piece is very good at the whole class side of it. It's not going to be one of those at the beginning you're going to turn to, you know, turn to a partner and all that. It, it is that whole class piece coming into play as you start training them. So then as they progress through the other grades, it can transition whole class, small group that you may be doing into a partner side. And then as they go into a writing side, individually thinking through things. As they thought through them, wrote them down, then they're able to articulate verbally because of the foundation that you set and being able to teach them how to do it. Whole group, analyzing the thinking and all that. All right. This is just summarizing all that. So the big piece here, and there's, there's a lot here, but you're familiar with this course. So what is it that the teachers are doing? And what is it that the students are doing? So if, you're, if you know it and you're already <coughs> implementing your classroom then, then what is it that you as the teacher are doing to get your students to that discourse level? Modeling. Okay, how do you do that? Just modeling the discussion, you know, and if one says something, you know, build on that, and okay. then have someone else build on whatever I've said. Perfect. I've seen or heard some teachers give student starters just mm -hmm. to help, especially in K-1, because they're teaching them how to start this out, so they get them, and then listening to those discussions that come from that. And, and with what you said right there, too, that's where the anticipating piece of, so knowing that you're anticipating ahead of time, that's where that's coming in there, to be able to have those starters ready because you've anticipated where to go with the questioning. I think the best part is that as teachers, we know how do we get kids talking, and we're able to ask questions, but what is it that we're wanting the students to start doing? What is that ideal behavior that, that you would want to see in your, your first grade class or your kindergarten class or your students doing? And these are just, just examples, but if I came into your classroom and had that strong mathematical discussion going on, what is it that you would want to see students doing? I'd like to see them maybe if you were using some kind of manipulative, working together to explain to another student why theirs wasn't going to work and what they needed to do to fix it. That's perfect. I know like yesterday, I was just walking around my room and they were in stations and they were doing a addition problem and one little guy said, well, seven plus one is seven, and it had the dots on it, and his partner was quick to say, well, it's not because count your dots, and they counted them together, and so that was just something that caught my attention where I wanted them all to hear it and to know that they can help each other. That's perfect. Those are the exact things that are going on 
And it's just teaching those foundations and then building on them from there. Um, just a, a few final thoughts on, on all the, the changes that are happening and where the shift is moving, that we're really not wanting the teachers anymore to be that conveyor of knowledge telling everything. We're really wanting you to go more to that facilitator of the learning. So I have learning that needs to happen. What can I do to help get the students there? So that way they're engaged in learning and they're doing it on their own. That listening to each other. So a lot of times there'll be a conversation, but are they really listening to what they have to say? Um, a big one is Xerox assignments. That does not mean that don't give uh, a workbook page is not what it's saying, but it's does the workbook page have true meaning or what is it that I could do to the page to bring in a little bit of a more thinking. So if I have basic addition problems, maybe instead of just answering the memory, attach that conceptual <coughs> piece of, you know, draw out you know, dots to match up to it. Showing that they know that you can see the thinking going on and how that's being applied. Um, it's not about the quantity of what out you, of what you're giving out. It's really that quality piece um, component to it. Being the cheerleader, um, don't let parents come to you and say that they don't like the new math because this to them <coughs> for this kind of problem is new math, but it's not. It's just being able to prove you know it's showing the thinking. The kids have the thinking. This, when this is missing, then when they're in Algebra 1, they're not able to have that conceptual understanding piece because they can't see it, because they can't model it. They don't have the tools they need or know how to use the tools because the most basic of conceptual understanding is missing out of their thinking. So when you look at a high ability kid, a lot of times we skip over them. Oh, they came to me counting already, they came to me adding. But do they, do they understand that conceptual piece? And so that takes you knowing your students to get down to that, or getting down to looking at their thinking and make sure they have the foundation they need. Those are going to be your, your physicist and your, um, you know, your really high order thinking. So to get them to the higher math courses, we've got to build the foundation now. Um, just because a parent was bad at math, we don't want the kids thinking that. So really building that that first um, persevering process standard to be able to show the kids it's not a badge of honor to be bad at math. So just kind of you know, building that part of it up to them um, so that they can do it. If you go to, this is what you would want to write down. Um, so I took the URL, and if you've ever used the website Tiny URL, um, it takes what it is and breaks it down to a smaller one. But it's just tinyearl.com backslash Franklin Math 2016. And that will give you a copy of the PowerPoint, the handouts that I have, and there are other files in that folder that could be used to go along with some of the other stuff that we talked about that are extra. So if that doesn't work or you have problems with it, you can send me an email and I'll get back to you. Um, if you guys do Twitter, we're trying to get the message out about the elementary side of it. Um, so you can do Twitter, or if you're doing things in your classroom, you use Twitter um, using the hashtag I-N-E-L-E-M -E -E STEM. Um, the big piece of it that we're trying to make the shift, and it's kind of why I wear multi-subjects, is to that connection piece of math to start connecting it to the technology, engineering, and science part of it. So you're building blocks in kindergarten. There's a math piece to it. How is it also part of, of science, of the engineering part of it? So I kind of wear all the hats to, to build that together. Um, so just because if you think of it just as math, um, kind of opening up that lens to the higher demand tasks to get a, a bigger picture of making the connections and all of it. Are there any questions? Kind of a lot, probably. If you ever have questions or anything, um, feel free to send me an email. Um, just know that I am here to help the classroom teachers in Indiana in any way, shape, form that I can. So if there's a resource that you think would be beneficial or you have questions on or 
you want to see specific examples on or, or whatever, send me an email and um, if I don't know the answer, I'll get it for you or it's kind of one of those, the different resources and documents that you see as part of my job not to develop those. So if there's something that you want or you want tweaked or um, just feel free to let me know and I can get that to you. All right. That's all I have for you, so you I think so you're lunchtime. Thank you. No questions, anybody? Okay. Let me with that.